Hello, everyone. <clears throat> the title of today's episode is Evil is the Death of Responsibility. Or one can say the death of responsibility is evil. That means when we recognize a being that is part of a system that is integrative in that system, regardless of how individually you think you're, uh, uh, the, like the person considers themselves, you know, a person has to recognize that animals on this planet, they run in herds. What I mean by that is that our existence has a value that our experience cannot always identify. Sometimes our experience of life can make the existence have zero value. That means if somebody makes you not want to challenge your life and to try to escape from confronting it, Guys, do you hear that in the background? That's the sound of trees dying. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. It's just a second, guys. Okay. All right. <clears throat> When I speak in these talks, I choose to look at the world in you. Which is a sort of responsibility to the future. We are responsible to the past to respect tradition, but we're responsible to the future to allow the new to enter. You can say evil is the effect of an inner cause. There is something that occurs within the person in the interpretation and contemplation of the moment that allows them to devalue one activity in regards to another or one outcome to another. So you see the problem with man subconsciously trying to be God is that in his attempt to attain power, he will begin to see this body is not made to carry a sort of eternal, um, okay, let's not get too abstract. Um, if you pick up more than you can carry, trying to tell you guys if, if um, inefficiency arises in the species when what is trying to be carried uh, it's like you're attached to too much phenomena on this planet because you want to experience all of it before you die but you don't recognize how much you're carrying in your hands in some sense Responsibility is an extracted meaning from existential movement. And what that means is the past allows us to be responsible for how it has moved. How our civilization moved before we were born, it is now our responsibility to move in this herd. I find that uh, true meditation and yogic practice is a, uh, 
reverse engineering of subjective existence into a direct objective experience that is in an unknown manner here. That means once our species climbs out of the whole, uh, out of this simulation called language, once we step out of language, we will be, we will see the true face of the unknown. When you see the true face of the unknown, that means the past could not prepare you for this moment. So you, in, in some sense, become the past's confrontation. That means like life has a sort of elegance to it where what you fight for is what lives on. You know, I, if I was to polish the title, I would say um, Individual Evil is the death of collective responsibility. And when we stop caring as a group for the members of the group, the group is doomed. Because eventually the same approach will be given to each individual member. I find that many people are taking even so much better than me, like taking great responsibility for outer engagement, for an engagement with their external world. As I'm speaking right now, there's the world in front of your eyes, there's the world behind your eyes. A lot of people are taking great, a great responsibility <clears throat> for objective consequence, but they are not taking a responsibility for subjectivity. We, we have not dared enter the mind because we have made it a ghost. When you make the mind a ghost, you can, you can never see it. You think it's, you feel it's there, but you can't see it because we, based on your definitions, it is different. It's like that thing where, you know, some, some philosophers and scholars, they came into this conclusion that there's, you can't conceptualize emptiness. Man's mind always has something in it. <coughs> now we find that the way we acknowledge emptiness is the absence of form or the absence of a sort of occupying shape. If we want to be truly responsible and in some sense truly confront our dark side. Carl Jung was a dude who this guy was like, okay, you got a dark side, you know, you can become a Sith Lord or a Jedi, but you gotta study. You gotta bring the the ability in an inefficient environment into an efficient environment. And you first do it internally. You allow the world behind your eyes to change simply. And then the world in front of your eyes gets a sort of complex aroma, uh, gets this sort of a complex aura. It, it becomes very fascinating for me that I could look at this object in front of me, like I'm looking at a lighter right now, and I could see this lighter, <clears throat> and I, I could think it's such a simple object. It's like an ant, you know, like how we consider ants, you know, insects. Insects are just tiny bits superior than objects. And animals, like... You know, mammals are like way more superior and then evolved and advanced animals are like the highest superiority. They're the one who's being the god of judgment in the moment. Because there is a god of judgment in every moment, ladies and gentlemen. There, for me, good and evil became the two, the, it became wings of the same bird that had nothing to do with where the bird was actually going. As if you are in this moment an intelligence uh, that is not just moving based on your thoughts. You think you're just moving based on your thoughts. You're also moving based on the thoughts of the universal sector. We are, if we consider, like here's the thing. <clears throat> One can say man in manifestation considered that he's on the physical shoulder of God. 
you know. But the mind of God is how the unknown even moves to move the known. And the thing about evil is that it's a structure, it's a construct, it's a response to a situation. And the response is being done without a responsibility for the other being's view. When you stop caring for a world, it dies. It's very simple. It's just like your thoughts. If you imagine right now, like it, like 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 you're walking on the wings of a giant bird, like an incredibly giant bird, like <clears throat> like level of size same as those turtles that would carry cities on their back, you know, like fantasy stories. So you're walking on the wings of this giant bird, you know. <clears throat> And as you are, you kind of see like that's an inner environment. And if you stop paying attention to the symbols that, that animate that environment into a sort of meaning for you, that environment dies. So think of it this way. Whatever your attention doesn't go on in your moment, that aspect or that relationship dies. If it's, if it's like a friend or a family member or any, any other human being, if you don't have attention, on their livelihood, they stop being alive to you. And the saddest thing is to be in a world filled with life, but not to acknowledge it. <clears throat> As if like, I'm like, what the hell atheist community? <laughs> like I understand atheism is trying to uh, solve the ir irrational injustice of religious influence upon society. Like I understand that. But at the same time, for me to just conclude that objectivity is the only domain of validity is nonsense. Because someone will simply ask, how do you know? And you see, we don't. Because our knowledge was made on a rock in the middle of nowhere. Our knowledge was crafted into uh, a, you know, symbolic existence. It was kept you know, on a rock in the middle of nowhere. On some level, we're in a... We're in somewhere where we have no idea where it is. We're in an unknown room, ladies and gentlemen. But we have created a known room in this unknown room, and we're just happy with that. <clears throat> For me, the concept of karma in Buddhism and the concept of destiny, for example, in Islam, <clears throat> these concepts seem to me the program of existential manifestation. That means before me putting a story, oh my God, I'm so unlucky or lucky because of my karma and what happens to me. You know, some days karma's a bitch, you know, some other days karma's not there. You know? <laughs> and so you see, what I'm trying to tell you is that we are moving in our own linguistic, self-generated simulation of what realness is. You're moving in your mind. And as you move in your mind, then the body is here. And so right now I'm touching my physical body, okay? But I've had dreams where in the dream I was able to touch my body. I was able to consciously move. And then I wondered what the hell. So this consciousness has no relevance to the motor senses that are asleep. As if the mind is in a world itself. Is The mind is a world in a world. And that's where the exploration is occurring. Sometimes... <clears throat> the greatest effort of knowledge is not just to teach people, you know, you can't teach a changing world too much. They all automatically learn eventually. That means, like, imagine this enlightened guru, but this enlightened guru suddenly looks at, his, looks at his, all these disciples, you know, and says, hey, hey guys, you know, I've already taught you guys everything in your past lifetime. Imagine, imagine an enlightened guru comes come and says this to you. Like, uh, you know, Indian Guru comes and says this to his disciples. And he says, now you are free. Now what will you do? And the greatest, the, the, honestly, this is what, te like, this is the thing. I'll tell you. Our educational system is, um, it's not evolved, ladies and gentlemen. The kids should not be asking the teacher questions. The teacher should be asking the kid how much they see the concept that they want to talk about. 
Because you don't understand, it's like ch like it's not just with children, just human beings. <clears throat> you can bring their bring out their greatness by kind of like just asking or giving putting a mirror in front of a value. When you put two mirrors in front of a value, then comes a sort of infinite responsibility. There have been moments where my, my soul has come across to me as a sort of infinite, uh, 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 like infinite empty uh, re uh, reflection between the mirror of my mind and the mirror of my body. What I mean by that is that <clears throat> I find that we're not just particles. We are what particles are moving in. Awareness is, seems to be the God of matter. For a long time, I was like, what is God? I actually asked that, like sincerely. And I thought, could God be an invisible archetype? And I realized if I assumed that God was an invisible archetype or an un unseen archetype, that's influencing the mind of the species, you know? And I was like, so what is this archetype and how much can it be understood? And I realized it's an archetype in the way that a natural law is a law. It's an archetype of, of manifest existence, as if your archetypes are, everything has raised from this earth if it, it is looking at them. Everything that looks at the sky has been raised by the sky. <clears throat> you tell me what, what you think is evil. A being looking at life, like waking up, you know, like waking up into existence this lifetime, and looking at the world and seeing some stuff that they feel is like being like mankind is still making mistakes with boxes over his head one wonders about the resolution and begins to see like again tell me who's like a person who doesn't care for the world or a person who cares for the world who you can you tell me which one will be more successful the one that cares for the actual world all your values, trust me, you can, when, when I sleep, I don't care about myself. In deep sleep, I have no thoughts on myself. I am not an idea in deep sleep. In my dream states, I am an idea, purely an idea. But in my waking state, I am uh, an idea in, uh, as in, in manifest form, in, in physical form. But be, when I sleep, I am just the idea. I am an awareness of subjective existence, you know? I'm, like when I say I'm an awareness, that means like fundamentally I'm saying the one looking out through your eyes is unknown and that's how it's identifying everything outside it's outside of itself as knowledge, as knowledge either received or not received. So for me, destiny and karma, one can say they're like, it's a sort of program. When, when you look at life, like this is what I'm saying, like this is what I would say the religious of the, the religion of design. I just like the thought came to me right now, to be honest. But I, I'll say it like the religious of design. The religion of design. What do I mean? I mean, in this religious view, design it was here before any significance or value, meaning, character, or whatever. Just look at the picture of this, um, uh, I've chosen for this talk. Just look at this thing. You see as if it's a light bulb that is lifting man to the greatest ambitions of his technology. It's all about seeing more about the world. And how you go about this, human beings have different styles, but they can fundamentally come to three styles. I consider there's only three types of people in the world. There's ones who they, their, their wisdom arises and they, in some sense, they comprehend change by creating things. They accept life through starting and creating things. 
There are people who can only accept life if they destroy it, you know, or stop it. And there are those who are, in some sense, in the middle ground where it's like, they, for them, they're, the meaning that comes from life is to change. Now, whether it's conscious or unconscious, it's to change. These people are the most level-headed. What that means is for them, it doesn't matter how the world is changing. They're, they can be still pleasantly alive on this planet. Once you take a responsibility for your inner life, you are trying to, for the first time, wonder how thinking occurs. And you're wondering about thought. And you're wondering about meaning. And you, stop, and you start walking back into your memory and re returning to various moments of your being where in those moments, language was in a different relationship or you, well, how you saw the world was different than how you see it now. When you understand that you have been seeing different worlds from the beginning of your life in, every pa in the passage of every moment, you kind of relax with your beliefs. You relax with knowledge. You stop. Knowledge is the shield. The sword, is, the sword becomes the unknown. You pretty much switch hands. Uh, not switch hands, like like you switch the weapon from your hand. You're, you're, you're just right now a creature that it can only be satisfied through a sort of condition. Your existence is conditional. And because we are objective beings, it, it will be. It will remain. Till the day I die, there will be conditions in this life that I must, in some sense, respond to, or I will become the, I will either be devoured by the condition, or I will devour the condition before it enters. That means, believe it or not, I sit here gracefully giving these talks, you know, like very peaceful. But if I was, if somehow I, I was given a talk, you know, in like, let's say thousands of years ago, it would be, civilization will still be in the fog of savageness. And so we have stepped out of the fog of savageness, but now we are in the fog of despair. As if before we were just in a chaotic condition, we were all like just vicious animals. And now, now we have calmed down. The same energy of that viciousness is now moving internally. You know, like, like someone who killed people thousands of years ago was it, would, would have a level of an intensity and frenzy that the person nowadays cannot have because there's other activities to do and mainly internal activities. To sit by a park bench with a cup of coffee and contemplate existence is, a, is for me, like, <clears throat> that is worth a million dollars. And honestly, governments, if, I, if, if there was, like, you know, and I've written about this in my science fiction novel, you know. But a government that truly cares for the being, cares for its own evolution. Because the potential of your comrade is the potential of your unit. Is the potential of your species. The victories of your neighbors are the victories of your species. Yet we are, we dwell in games of language, separated from one another like bewildered beasts, you know, dwelling. And not all of us, of course, whereas there's 8 billion of us. You know, I can't speak for exactly how 8 billion people are experiencing, but the general theme that the civilization is going through is that we are evolving from despair. And our despair is ge being generated by the stories that we tell ourselves. And if we're not responsible for an inner transformation, we will never, we will never care enough for the objective world to understand it. As if the gods of matter came to the scientists and said, you have denied the ultimate to be accessed because you are in an endless search. You know, like this is the, this could be a folly of the scientific method when it tries to replace um, uh, other values in society. I respect scientists incredibly. I respect science. It, 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 is, um, it is part of our destiny. Science is part of the destiny of humanity. But um, so has religion. And so has many other cultures and how they have lived to generate some sort of patterns of recognition. And in some sense, our species has been engaged in tool creation. 
So this means that from the beginning, we have been trying to hold on to the next thing. As if like a part of the soul is a part of the one's moment is dying, but a part of them is also alive and living. So a part of you is running towards chaos, and to, uh, and a part of you to confront chaos is marching towards chaos, and a part of you is in some sense running away from the chaos, is trying to cower away in orders of comfort. This is why children, young children, have always been able to enlighten adults by their silliness. As if the child comes and asks the parent, like, why? And the parent gives an answer, you know, like, why am I here? And the, kid, and the parent gives an answer, and then the kid says, why? And why? And it's like a new word, a new way of expression the kid has learned. And so the kid comes and says, why, why, why? <laughs> And then the parent eventually sees, holy shit, this kid is over, over, it's like, how can I tell you? It's like, has found an uh, endless loop in, 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 in conceptualization. So it's a, it's a sort of uh, silly enlightenment, as if like, <clears throat> the moment an adult acts childish, it's funny. The moment a child acts like an adult, it's funny. Like a super young child. Like there was this YouTube video of this young kid acting like a boy. <laughs> Mr. Within is saying if there is a chance, 0, 0.00 hour amount of zeros you want, 1% chance that reality is multi dimensional, which, which could imply that we're in more rooms than one. We cannot just use the method of the visible dimension of the visible room to comprehend the methods of the visible room. There has to be an exploration that's going to occur. And pretty much we as a species, uh, I'm, I'm assuming these talks that I'm giving, trust me, like the way I'm seeing it is that I'm assuming world peace has already occurred. I don't care what people say. Like they'll be like, yo, man, don't, that's an illusion. We're not at peace. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter because we cannot evolve to our greater phase unless we stop violence objectively and in some sense transform the violence. The, the, all that energy that goes to violence should become internal. Once it's internalized, it will begin moving the mind. When the mind moves, you become a sort of responsibility of your overall moment. So, you be, so knowledge begins in some sense shaping. It, you, you become very knowledgeable in the sense that you have not try to just memorize knowledge, you have tr confronted the unknown. You have dared go where no man has ever been, where no eyes have ever seen. And that is the value. You are a unique exploration. No being has your eyes. And if there is a potential to your ability and to your mind in, in some sense solving or bringing about the greatest solutions, then in some sense, like what can I say? The world is waiting for you. I consider our knowledge to be a boat in an ocean of emptiness and in an emptiness that appears empty because our knowledge cannot comprehend it yet it does not mean there is activity there, there is activity non-intelligible activity you see it's it's like a child holds like a young a very young child like let's say five years old holds its toy like its teddy bear at night and just sleeps now what what is going on there? What's happening? Why is that? Why is your child holding that furry object that costs like twenty bucks or something? <laughs> because they have imbued that object with a personality that is actually a reflection of their own mind. When your child comes and says they talk to an imaginary friend. I want you to slow a hand clap for your child, for your child has, been a, has, has had an ability to, per, to, to see a reflection of their own personality in another phenomena, in another consideration. They have, their imagination is open. And the death of imagination occurs when 
the non-creative stop protecting the creative. You gotta protect those who, it's like those with the sword must protect those with the pen. And those with the pen must protect those who haven't held the pen yet. And life goes on. It goes on with an honor of a species that stared at extinction and was like, I would, you know, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Don't go gentle into that good night. You know? We tame chaos with order by showing that the order has a value that the chaos has been blind to. And in the gaze of, in, in the, when we find, when we find the moment where our order has been corrupt, because evil can attack you in two ways. It can attack your character, it can, that means you can start thinking nonsense about yourself and then go, be a spiral into an unconscious inefficiency, incapability, or you can be, or the opposite can occur. And all I'm saying is, there is no point of getting enlightened in a burning world. We must handle the fires first. There's a, I want to share some stories now. There's a story of Guru Padmasambhava. Guru Padmasambhava was like this, they considered him a Buddha, a Bodhisattva, a very, a very elevated being, like an already perfected being. Usually human beings that come on this earth, they're imperfected and the self-help industry it exists to motivate them towards their perfection. However, Guru Padmasambhava was a being that was not going, was not going, his consciousness did not enter the world from imperfection to perfection. It entered the world from perfection to imperfection. What that means is he entered the illusion from a state of clarity. He watched the world and did not fight it to destroy it, yet to allow it to live. Because you just don't want your, your, your friends and family to just survive. You want them to live. You want them to actually live their lives. And so the fog of the modern war is ideology. Ideology that blinds you into a pattern, in a looped pattern of behavior for many years of your life. And now, now Mr. Within is I'm pleading. I am vowing to the living world and I am, I am asking, why not attempt the performance of a lifetime? Why not attempt the great work? Why not attempt the ultimate responsibility to give a try, to just try and see what the higher levels of our efficient existence as a civilization would be? For me, you know, gangs was, uh, I see gang violence around the world. I see organizations of evil intent and organizations of generous intent. The government plays the role of a hero in the life of the individual that has been too busy living their own life. Yet, any system that reduces the value of the being to themselves is a negative system. And if it is inevitable, as if we have to walk in a dark room, then never forget the light of your eyes. There will be moments on this planet where you will be completely alone. And there will be moments on this planet where you will be alive with your species. You will forget, you will forget languages you, you will see what tradition did not, and you will be what the future could not. And therefore the future moves in the decisions of the minds of men. In the minds of an advanced ape, so believe.
For me, I am constantly, what, what honestly inspires these talks is this constant uh, wonder about the, the edge of uh, intelligent effort. You become responsible for your inner reality through at first the shoes of a shaped witness, a subjective witness, then that subjectivity fades. And trust me, there are moments on this planet where you will enter your true nature. You will reach, you will go in the zone. You will go in the divine zone. <laughs> in the divine zone, you're, you're, you're moving with the rhythms of the earth. There is no longer a resistance from the world to uh, and there's no there's no longer resistance uh, arising from the external reality and there's no longer resistance arising from the inner reality you find the sort of pure magnificent movement you become you become the eyes of the moment you become the whole moment watching phenomena occur and when you become the whole moment watching phenomena occur that is the death of identity so i'm telling you all those people who like spirituality or whatever like those people are going towards the death of their identities in the acknowledgement of grander ways that the universe is working. We all have to polish our eyes, you know, or in some sense take off the blindfold. Your whole right now, like even me right now, everything that I think I am right now, let's say all the thoughts I had in this moment, I just believe that I'm just those thoughts, right? I will eventually see time will slap this belief out of my hand and in the changes of the world I will be a change in that world you see but we have the evolutionary ability of consciousness as if like you look at your dog and you're like okay this dog does not it is not aware of its mortality in the same way that we are you know we, we can say that if you smoke cigarettes yeah you know like it, you're gonna be on this earth a bit less it makes sense. Yet, why are you here at first and then you see it? It's kind of like from the, you know what pulls you out of your depression? The dark, not depression, that pulls you out of um, your hopeless views upon the world? It is creative inspiration. And inspiration means you have not <clears throat> as if from the present moment you your mind oscillates between the past and future to shape your present identity which is as temporal as the new data that enters your system and as as much as the old data leaves our knowledge has reached an interesting point and i really hope academia academic institutions really acknowledge this <clears throat> The archetypes of your identity are sort of the gods of man's mind or the laws of the inner world, which are in some sense patterns and relationships that's developed. My personal intelligence in this moment, to be honest, I'm a series of patterns. Like in some way, my intelligence is like gears and cogs moving. But on some level, there's an awareness to the gears and cogs and then there's an awareness of a new mechanism, of a new mode of existential possibility. So the ability of language gave us an inner scope. It, it kind of was like language was the portal into the subjective dimension. That's where the subjective evolution began. It began with a separation of, of phenomena as one phenomena into man in world. And now the ethics of this man in this world, its morality is fundamentally based on its stories. But our civilization will get to a point where people will feel right and wrong because they will feel that the being they're seeing, the people that they see throughout their day, they are, uh, they, uh, they, the way their intelligence sees them is that they are a part of your world. 
They are part of your moment. The same, like I, this is what I understood about a sort of equanimity. That the same value I have for this body, like this physical body right now, I think of myself, yo, I'm like free or whatever. The same value I have for any of any phenomenon, it, uh, not any phenomenon, any object, any object in my awareness. Right now, a part of you is this objective physical body, but a part of you is some sort of spherically, spherically endless subjective attention. Okay. That means, okay, let's give matter the driving, the steering wheel and say matter came first. Matter has led to some consciousness now is, that is looking at the matter and like, what the fuck, how am I matter? You know? <laughs> how am I, am I a materialistic creature when I'm aware of it in, in materialistic ways? In the sense that there is a sort of, as if like the purpose of the physical universe was to create the non-physical universe, the subjective universe. You know, the, the ideas that atheists, uh, the philosophical implications of certain, certain religious ideology, certain mystical ideology, certain spiritual ideology, you know, certain magical ideology, like magic. Okay, we'll give magic some, some official here. <laughs> but I'm telling you that how it's like, it's like the game Jenga, like, or like, it's like, it's like a bunch of dominoes where you're placing the dominoes one by one. You are pl placing the beliefs, the fundamental patterns uh, that in some sense give depth to life. And when you listen to these Mr. Within talks, I'm just sharing linguistic patterns that my mind generates because my mind is no longer a thought and body and it took me like, like, like you know, one fourth of my life to understand it. And now I'm, I'm, I feel like, who knows how long the breath dwells in the body. But the breath is the opportunity for this ancient organic being. Like your body, your DNA is a pattern passed down. You know? Our per, what we, like when we see a biological entity uh, that has a personality communicating to another biological, by another biological entity that is um, okay. It says okay. when one biological uh, entity um, with a personality communicates to another biological entity with a personality. The modern, the the, the postmodern culture will begin to notice that the relationship is a relationship with the biological design and with the mind's design. That means, imagine uh, 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 places of work became places of healing. So what I mean by that is that companies began caring for the nutrition, nutrition of their employees. And they began caring for the nutrition of their employees in a way where they, how can I tell you, it makes sense to help the weak because the strong can hold their ground until you help the weak and can go help the strong. Oh my God, the song changed totally. <laughs> For me, you, you cannot be a, a great member of your species unless you have a great responsibility level for phenomena. This great responsibility level ha comes at an opportunity cost. Sometimes when you do internal work, when you go right or you, you dabble in communication as a sort of effort of advancing civilization, you, you, there's an opportunity cost of, of how you, there are certain physical activities you don't do. do. So for me, it's kind of like your life is, is like how there's certain, it's like a bunch of dimensions, like your life is split up into dimensions that you have to water with your attention and engagement. You have to do something about a certain state of your being, like, like you're not just here to experience just chemical brain, like your, your state of being is changing all the time, but in each state of change, you must in some sense, some of those states engage with the world, some of those states not engage with the world. You see, this is why Leo Tolstoy said the strongest warriors are time and patience. 
Why did he say that? Because you, the patient warrior does not make the first mistake. And time is the endless hope. Time, when your hope becomes as effortless as time, as if, like, imagine the human being that began, uh, you know, fighting with the Lord of time. And in that confrontation, the human being said, if time, if time does not stop, who says I will? Who says my will will not conquer time? Even though time conquers all materialistic phenomena. Because atoms are given freedom of rights by the universe to not be together all the time. Do you see what I'm saying? The atom, the molecule is, is, a, is, a, is a luxury for the atom. And when your elements, for me, I, I am in utter reverence of my body. You know, it's as if like, uh, this is kind of hilarious. It's as if we all have a sort of pantheistic, of uh, divinity to our to our physical body as if we don't worship like objects but this body that we are we don't just worship it we're saying we are it do you see and so this is the fascinating thing that we are we are a series of dimensions that work together like we, we are we are different store characters in the same unknown story and it is our collective efforts that truly become the greatest performances of knowledge. I just want to see it. For me, I don't care if we, like it doesn't matter for me if there's extinction or not. I mean, it, it, it does to some degree, but like <laughs> the way I'm saying that is like, it doesn't matter the outcome of a million years from now or a trillion years from now. I could be given this talk in a trillion years from now and it, it'd be like in, in the middle of the uh, Andromeda and uh, Milky Way galaxy as if they intersected, you know? So for me, it's one of those things where it doesn't matter the range, the right action will bring the right view. Sometimes you realize you, are, you're, you start off without, without any ability. Before you can gain ability, you must have the a sort of wonder of how that ability is there and how the things that are, how your problems are in your moment. Pretty much like some dude waking up and realizing like, holy shit, the store's about to close and he's looking at all the customers and like, sorry guys, you know, you know, <laughs> please make your decisions quick, you know, time is not, uh, you know, with us in this moment, you know. <laughs> Pretty much water a dimension of your life where you're doing new things, water a dimension of your life where you're stopping certain things that you were doing, and water a dimension of your life where you appreciate it all changing. And if you can maintain this in a very simple way, your mind will become no longer, the ego is, the ego is like a shield that appears out of nowhere. The ego doesn't exist. Okay, because you're fundamentally an attention moving around in a waking world. You see? In the waking state of consciousness, me and you are having this conversation. So man has all, it's like it was, it was honestly an internal evolutionary leap when with the concept of an existential simulation entered man's mind. And I honor, I honor mystics. Because personally, I, my eyes opened in that way. For me, rather than me having some route of knowledge, some practice to find truth, I, I preferencelessly walked into nature and wondered. And when wonder and honesty merge, revelation occurs. Inevitably it will, because your effort doesn't stop. The child that wants candy will get candy, you know what I mean? <laughs> but the child that wants, uh, you know, clarity will also get clarity. And if the archetypes that defined your inner child, your memories of who you were, stop thinking you're your memories. They're momentary projections, I'm telling you. That's why you can't hold on to a memory forever, you know? We got to relax with our thoughts. We got to stop thinking we have thoughts or we think thoughts or, you know, we got to stop using language that way. It's an, it's an ignorance. The whole, the beautiful thing about language 
is that the next wave of linguistic engineers and explorers, these beings will in some sense look at language and recognize rather than the, 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 the uh, inefficient system being eradicated, rather than we take a Thanos from the Avengers approach to, you know, a grateful world, we gotta, we gotta in some sense recognize language exists to be reshaped. Language is like clay. Your ancestors used it in a certain way, you can use it in any way you want. I personally, like if there's somebody listening who's really studied literature, you know, I'm speaking as if you're, gonna, you're not going to be, you're not going to think I'm speaking in a normal way. Let me tell you why. Because I, I speak with an image there and then I put words to the image. I'm seeing something before I find words for them. Do you see? So that's the relationship <clears throat> in many of these talks I have, but in every moment I have a different moment. Like, what can I say? Conception is a beautiful illusion that is keeping us alive. So we need illusion to survive. Truth needs illusion to survive. That's all I'm saying. So we got to protect the illusion as if it's a citizen, as if the evil person in the community is still a person in the community. And regardless of whichever side of doubt your ears are inclined towards. If you don't care for the world, then why do you care for being? Like, why, why is it here? Why is existence here? Like, what is there to reason from a spontaneous moment of existential phenomena? How, how, how important are the stories that dictate our morality? What's, what is, what story is the world telling itself? That's, that's where the great inner rebellion and the great rebellion of the advanced communicators occurs. A new renaissance of beings who no longer are denied the freedom of their ability to utilize every tool in their disposal, whether it's their thoughts, whether it's whatever, to allow a, a new efficient system to emerge. That new efficient system that will emerge, it has to have a collective effort because we need everybody's involvement to build a system that works for everybody. That's what I mean. So we need the, the silent eyes of civilization to find the global stage. Share your stories with the world. Because why else would you be an evolved animal that could, has the ability to communicate? Whatever your attention goes on, that keep that that state that is more alive to you. Study your attention. Then truth will be satisfied when it looks at itself in the mirror. I hope this talk has served you. Much blessings and also. Awesome.